Hi, I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be talking to the costume designer of Nightmare Alley, Louis Cicada. And Louis, I would love to start by talking about your process in working with the scripts and, and how you start breaking everything down, because there's so many intricacies as you're going through character by character, but especially with this film, it's not just character by character, it's also about the evolution and the narrative arc and the story and the journey that they're going through. You know, if we look at Bradley Cooper's character in particular, there's so much change in terms of what you're doing with costume there. And so what's your starting point in how you start creating breakdowns for yourself to then begin conceptualizing potential designs? So I get I, the, you know, the first, the first step is really identifying the world or the worlds as, as the case might be. And so it's an incredible amount of, of research um, into uh, late depression, uh, early post-depression, rural versus um, city, uh, poor versus rich, fashionable versus unfashionable. And then going from there, it really is collecting imagery and research and uh, fabric swatches and color palettes and um, identifying what, what was true to the time. Um, and then from there, it's, it's starting to curate various images and fabrics and um, colors for each of the characters and then working with each of the characters' arcs as they, as they pertain to the film. Mm -hmm. and, and it sounds like you use such a wide breadth of, of source material for that research process. And, you know, I, I saw one mention of like some sketchbooks that you actually already owned for, that were like late 1930s French um, Parisian sketchbooks. And are you just kind of always kind of going through life and, and seeing various books and, and pieces of material on design from different time periods and just kind of collecting it in case it comes into play for future projects? Totally, totally. The the menswear book that I purchased was in the late 80s and it was an Italian three volume set and I didn't know I was going to do a 30s anything. I just loved the book and loved the, the amount of uh, deep diving of research that it had. It had the fabrications for the, the suits and the coats and the ascots and the ties and um, the hats and, and proportions and, you know, all of that was invaluable um, to try and find uh, elsewhere so I purchased that and and likewise you know collecting catalogs so that you understand what is that time what is the time before what is the time after um, and in that case you you really kind of isolate where you are in history um, so I'm a bit of a collector in fact I had to move my library out of my Victorian home uh, because the second floor was starting to sag so um, you know, luckily for everybody, digital is, uh, is uh, alive and well and uh, hard drives are not as heavy as the books, but uh, I still love a book. I still love a catalog. In fact, you know, those old catalogs with fabric swatches right in them is, is you know, information that's priceless um, to communicate not only, you know, as a as a artistic um, maneuver, but also as a communication to the, to the shoppers or to suppliers or with the director. And we can actually see what are the colors of the day and then how do we want to manipulate them for the film? Yeah. And, and this wasn't your first time collaborating with Guillermo del Toro, having recently worked with him on The Shape of Water. And I love the way that he, it sounds like he has so much respect for the work that you do, the way that he views costume design, even going so far as to describe it as, you know, once you go into a close up, that that is the set design as well. You know, it is the production design. The costumes are the only thing that you're seeing around the actor's face at that point, which is really beautiful to hear. And how does working with a director that has you know that much connection to what you're doing and the specificity of the details and thinks about it in that way really shape the collaboration that the two of you end up having and the work that you're able to do off the back of that well I would, I, first of all I'd say no pressure at all like zero pressure uh no I mean it's it you know Guillermo really makes you um uh strive hard I mean I always already have that in my own in my own psyche and, and philosophy of, of work and life um but you you really want to do the best job that you can at every turn at every decision and as as a designer um you know in that film I might have made thousands of decisions uh, design decisions and that is you know fabrics to to um the amount of washing pre-washing we do what kind of patina we're putting on um, creating, uh, changing a pattern uh, by, by changing the rinses that we put through. And so those kind of decisions are so numerous that Guillermo and I have this shorthand that I'm able to bring to him um, what I believe he will like or is in his wheelhouse. Um, and so that, um, given our 10-year history of working on and off together, 
uh, makes it uh, facilitates the ease of, of discussion and collaboration. I was also really interested in in some of the camera test work that you do, um, and you've described how part of your process is doing 360 camera tests and, and taking photos and really looking at costume designs from every single possible angle that the camera might pick it up from. What was the point at which you started to do like full 360s rather than just, you know, looking at things front on or side on? And, and how has that really changed the way that you're thinking about some of the more minute details in costume? So for me, it really, it started in the fitting room and I think it was uh, uh, working with more of the fantastical elements on the strain. And I found a, a unique thing which people use for websites and for product and, you know, the thing spins around and you can actually spin it um, how, you know, watch a pair of shoes spin around. And so I thought this would be great actually for costumes. So, you know, much to my actor's chagrin, they're standing on a little, uh, on a little platform that turns around and they have to hold still, but it's a, you know, incredible way to really isolate and, you know, go into every, you can zoom into a, to a close-up, you can zoom into a hem, you can, um, and it works really, really well with when you're dealing with proportion, um, with design, and also looking to see if a suit sits properly uh, from the front to the side to the back, um, and I find it really, really useful. Uh, I do it also with mannequins so that I don't have actors uh, dealing with, with that, but, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's wonderful way to, to really, um, isolate your design details and your proportion. And one of the things that's so striking with this film is the use of color in such a specific way to tell story and to speak about characters, um, you know, and there's a real marriage between what the lighting is, what the color in the production design is, and what the color is in the foreground that we're seeing in the costumes as well. And so what does that collaboration with the production designer, the cinematographer, and Guillermo look like as you're starting to figure out not just how you're telling a story through color, but how you're all cohesively telling a story through color together? Yeah, well, absolutely. I mean, the first, as, as I mentioned with imagery, the first thing is really identifying the color palette of each world and um, then identifying with Guillermo going over each character and what the predominant color range would be for each character. And then, you know, putting that together into the tapestry that becomes a film and especially for the carnival um, aspect. Uh, we had so much, you know, varying colors, but in a very specific you know, color palette. Uh, and then it became about rinses and, and adding age to everything. Um, in the case of both the carnival and the city, we built 90% of those, those costumes uh, because we needed multiples. We were dealing with rain. And so a lot of time went into modifying color, modifying finishes, uh, removing finishes from fabrics. Um, and then working with, with Tamara, obviously, about, you know, where, where is the... Where does red and uh, where is red being used? Where can we use green? We remove we remove a color from a world. We add it to another. Um, uh, and then once we're closer, we can we we talk to Dan Lauston. We do camera tests. We discuss the lighting levels because it, in that case you could have a super bright um, color, but because the light the lighting level is so low, it actually gives you color as opposed to you know pre muting everything. Um, and then once you get to to set and you start seeing how it's lit, it, it just all squishes down to to varying shades of gray. So um, so, you know, with each each character, Gamma had very specific ideas about about um, ideals of each character. Cena was green and gold and and um, uh I'm blanking out right now. Uh, I was like, Molly, stand and just shouting character uh, names at you. (laughs) Willem Dafoe's character, you know, was leather and tobacco. And and then, um, uh, oh my God, sorry. Like the great uh, reds with um, Molly as well. Well, and Molly, we have, you know, we have the muted kind of deep raisin reds uh, in the carnival. And then, and then we go into really quite striking red in the city. And, and so, once we we established those, uh, I want to say barriers or, or or markers, then I go in and and continue uh, creating that tapestry where I can fit the minor characters into that palette, um, and also trying to give each character their unique look so that they complement the story as a whole. 
And you brought up lighting there and the way that things can look very different on camera than they do in the room. Um, and, and one of the things that it sounds like you did a lot of lighting tests were the more velvet materials because they tend to read much lighter. So you almost need brighter colors of that when you're actually in production and on set. So what were, what were some of the, the different costumes or pieces that looked really different on camera than they did in the room when you were all filming with them? Well, you know, specifically the velvets are, are actually the reverse. They actually suck color, right? Oh, out. No, 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 it's all good. Um, and so we had a beautiful dress that that um, that I wanted to use. And I uh, threw it in front of one of the first camera tests and was like, wow, that's like black, but it's not. Um, and so I thought, OK, because we were using a, a quite a bit of velvet for the city, um, I wanted to do a, a actual camera test that was specific to velvets. Um, amongst other things, obviously, but uh, but the velvet was really surprising about how much light it actually sucked off um, from from the, the picture. And so, uh, you know, point of reference, we had a beautiful uh, cranberry velvet dress for Rooney Mara's character, and it appeared to be like basically black. So we had to make that dress again in almost a watermelon watermelon cherry color kind of wall of watermelon taffy um, for it to appear its original color so i found that kind of fascinating it was like a, a specific that was a specific thing that we looked into um, uh, and again with all a lot of the other fabrics i would have the swatches with varying degrees of um, rinses put on them so that we could see what was the best uh, complement to the lighting levels so quite technical, uh, you know, we always talk about, you know, how artistic it is and it is. Um, and, uh, but there, there's a ton of technical backstory to, to each of those things beyond the, you know, my feet hurt and beyond, you know, these pants are too big or too small now, or, or do I, am I wearing this again, so to speak. Um, so it's, it's uh, quite a wide array of, uh, you need a wide array of, of, attributes to be able to tackle a job like this. And you were also bringing up before that idea of, of taking characters and, and really navigating and charting their journey on screen through their costumes. Um, and so wanted to kind of take the example of Bradley Cooper's character, talk about that because the costumes that he's wearing by the end are so specific and tailored, you know, all of a sudden he's wearing like a full three piece suit with a waistcoat. He's wearing a tie with a matching scarf around it. And at the beginning he's wearing clothes that really haven't been tailored and fitted as much to his body. It's clothing that's worn and, you know, the white, Whites are, are really kind of muddied up from just being worn over the course of several years, which is like weathering yeah. that you and your team are, are doing. And so how did you kind of set about making a lot of the choices of, of charting his character journey through such a shift in costume? Well, well, yeah, I mean, good eye. He's noticed the, the, the dingy white, which was what, what it was. Um, uh, when we talked about Bradley, uh, about Stan, the character, we talked about, you know, a man of no means, a man of great means and then a man of zero means. And so um, the beginning of his arc was really about finding the you know quintessential pieces that would be everyday clothing, but yet bring him away from, from his environment. And um, so the fit was obviously looser. Um, the, the shirt was pressed. Uh, we had a scene where he was actually pressing his shirt. It didn't make it into the film, but um, that was the whole adage of having a man who has nothing pressing whatever he has to look as presentable as he could. Um, and uh, there was discussion about canvas and, and leather. And, and then I brought up the idea of a plaid um, because it would be a, a unique look in that tapestry of the, of the carnival. And I found this wonderful old plaid uh, wool that um, was from, from not quite that period, but pretty close. Uh, and it came in two colorways and we looked at it um, and we decided that was going to be a really great way to bring um, the Stan character out from, from his environment. And we aged the fabric before we, we built the garment. And then we tried on our first prototype with him and, and really um, fine tuned the fit so that it wasn't fitted. It wasn't exactly a movie star. What we didn't want is we didn't want a movie star. Um, and so we, we decided there were very few pieces that he would be wearing repeatedly and that in order to tell the story or the the time passed we would introduce a new piece a new jacket that would come in as he was gaining um as he was gaining power let's say throughout the, throughout the story and money he was he was buying 
something um, to add. Then we move to the city, and of course, it's a complete um, chameleon change. And um, I've said it before, and you know, the, the the underlying thing was that Stan, the character, would have burnt anything from the carnival, tossed it and burnt it, and and would have bought a brand new um, uh, wardrobe in order to present this new persona. And with that, of course, it was, you know, really finely fitted um, suits and beautiful fabrics and exquisite silks. And, and again, we built a lion's share of that because there was just no way to find, um, you know, suits of that time that were going to be as fresh as they needed to be. And, and within the color palette, finding, finding, you know, ties that would fit, it was pretty impossible. Um, so that was kind of amazing to be able to, to create that world as well opposed to the, the carnival world. Um, and, yeah. and similarly with that idea of, of a trajectory that goes from the carnival world into kind of like the city upper class world, you've got Rooney Mara's character as well that's going through that scope. But um, I read something where you were mentioning that you wanted to do certain things that kind of show the relationship to Bradley Cooper's character to Stanton and the fact that, you know, he's kind of dictating a lot of things for her. And so what were some of the, the details within her costuming that really represented that side of it? I think it was that use of red um, uh, and the and the style of of clothing. It was a bit more. Um, it was still quiet, but it was a bit more showy. It was more showy than than what we knew Molly to be. Um, and there was a sense of uncomfortableness that she showed when she was dressed like that. And she always wanted to get out of those those clothes back into her her comfy clothes. And we we retained some of the pieces that she wore in the carnival. Um, that she would throw on over top of her her dress clothing to still feel her old world, and that was again that was how um, uh, it worked in balance with with Stan having nothing from the carnival. Um, we I wanted to have something that was that was going to give us that that thread through and that root rooting mm -hmm. to the carnival. And in fact, when she leaves, she she wears some of those clothes um, as she's returning. Mm -hmm. And you you were mentioning before kind of like the the greens and golds of, of Tony Collette's character, Madame Zena. Um, but I've also kind of like heard it being described as like representing that her character's prime was kind of a few years ago as well. And so what were the influences that came in to represent that aspect of her? For sure. I mean, a lot of the characters in the carnival were were had their heyday earlier and they were still hurting. Um, and so a lot of the clothing harked back. Uh, which, you know, again, uh, speaks to my collection of, of research material and, and catalogs. And, and we were able to kind of look, look um, towards the, the late 20s and when these people had their heyday. Um, and then even the performance um, outfit, it was something that she had worn for so long. It, had, it was aged. And conceptually, it was something that she would throw into a trunk um, till the next location. Uh, and so uh, there was a, a real importance to aging the gold um, dress and, and the robe to give us that history. Um, and the same thing with Pete, his leather jacket he had bought some 20 years ago, and it was still lovingly cared for. And this was something that we, you know, um, Guillermo and I always spoke about because in the time people did not have disposable fashion. They still took very good care of their, their, um, clothing instead of in, in in fact Willem Dufoe we see him cleaning his shoes all, you know repeatedly during the film so there, there was a there's a sense of care for what you have um and so with each character we, we really kind of decided where um that person kind of stopped so to speak in their in their design development and and because you know it happens our aunt our, our auntie stopped in 93 or what what have you and and in actual fact we never wear everything from today we would always have things from five years ago or your favorite sweater from 20 years ago or, or whatever so i wanted to in essence with each of those characters give them that kind of um layering on on style points yeah. And, and you're bringing up all of the weathering there. And there was a lot of weathering that, that and worn aspects that you were shaping into these costumes. 
but I was interested in the different types and the different ways and the different degrees to which you were weathering things. Because like you said, a lot of things that people were really taking care of. So, you know, like Zena's outfit that needed to look like it had been worn on stage a bunch, but also, you know, she would have taken such great care of that to make sure that that was still stage presentable for an audience is going to be very different to, you know, what Bradley Cooper's wearing in like his day to day that, you know, is just getting a little bit more muddied up in a different way than a stage outfit is. And so what were some of the different techniques or ways that you were looking at weathering materials? Well, I mean, I had an incredible crew uh, of, of agers and dyers and uh, textile artists that we would, again, do, you know, boards with different patinas to really find, find what, what spoke to the, the costume with the fabrics. And in fact, once we started building those, those garments, um, I would always send uh, swatches over to, to them to, to start their process rather than doing it with the garment. Um, and really it was, a, it was about care. It was about giving, giving things age, but then polishing them up. And with, in the case of, of um, Willem's boots, it was about, we, we killed them and then we, we, we brought them back. And so you have this kind of, not fighting, but it, it's cohabiting, um, so to speak, of, of uh, aging and care which is quite prevalent. I mean, you see that now, if you find a, an old pair of something, you can see that it, it has that care, um, even though it has the age, it has the patina, there, there's a crackle to a leather, there's, there's age on, on a seam or a, an edge, but it's still um, been creamed and, and, and taken care of. So it really was about finding what was the character, what was the, the, the use of that garment, um, and in the case of Zena's performance, it was old, but it wasn't dirty. It was worn out, but it wasn't threadbare. So it was, it was really trying to, to discern, again, part of that decision process. And I, I, I often say we are costume designers, but we are costume deciders. And we make decisions, like hundreds of decisions a day um, on things. And, and you live in, and die by those decisions, not only for that day, but three months down the road at RAP, at, when you're watching the movie, it's it's all about those those um, poignant decisions that you make um, each and every day for your final product. And for the items that you had to source for this film, it sounds like that was quite a production within itself because the majority of the rental house, you know, there's only a finite number of of vintage items from this period that are at the rental houses and other productions that already kind of grabbed a lot of pieces. And so you kind of, so it's like went traveling around Europe, just looking for different pieces. And was it about looking for specific pieces or looking for accessories and fabrics and materials that you could concoct into things? Because you were mentioning that, you know, about 90% of the costumes and of the pieces that we see on screen were all completely crafted from scratch. Yes. So, I mean, the, the, the short story to that long story is that when, I, when we started looking at um, procuring um, costumes for the extras, uh, I made my usual calls to the LA rental houses, New York rental houses, and everyone was like, oh, it's really picked over and, you know, everything's on Mank or uh, there was a, another TV show, uh, Perry Mason. Um, and we don't really have much and not sure when it's coming back. And so, uh, you know, Houston, we have a problem. Uh, we have to find an alternate uh, supplier. So that's when uh, Guillermo and I talked about going to Europe and going to Spain and Italy and the UK. And, um, and that was like a, a wonderful, happy accident in the sense that it brought um, a whole new world to me. Uh, you know, having worked with some of these rental houses only very specifically for specialty things, um, and now I was I was working with them on a on a huge scale, um, and uh, and so with that there were also other rental companies that I had no idea of and new new working relationships, um, and we would pull I'd go I went with my assistant and who you know was indispensable, and uh, we would pull costumes during the day until three o'clock and then we'd run to the fabric stores between four o'clock and seven to do a fabric pull. And, and it really was about curating um, fabrics for, for the whole movie, which was a little, uh, you know, oh, I have to admit, overwhelming to um, spend, uh, you know, your first six hours of your day, just, you know, visually going through piece, piece, piece. It was like a Rolodex of pieces and picking yes, no, yes, no, 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 yes, yes, yes. And then going and doing the same thing with fabrics till, till they closed or till, till they kicked us out. Um, 
and, and then it was, you know, antique markets and uh, notion, you know, buttons and, and appliques and um, accessories and uh, vintage vendors. It was all about, um, it was all about bringing what I could find together into, into a curated collection. Um, and, and each bolt of fabric had a small card. We had a wall of fabric so that uh, it wasn't a case of looking on a shelf. It was a case of pulling a, a small card and starting to play with, with each of these um, fabrics to, to work out the boards for each character. Um, of course, you know, it continued on and on and on until almost we finished, but, but it was a great base um, of travel and inspiration um, and creativity. And with the pieces that you made for the film, it's not just the clothes and the outfits that the characters are wearing. It's items like hats, shoes being made from scratch. You know, what were a lot of those items beyond just the outfits that you were working with your team and, and bringing in different skill sets and, and craftsmen to create? Well, we, we did, you know, leather work, we did ties, we did lingerie, um, we did hats, uh, we had jewelry made. Um, yeah, it was, it was full on footwear. Uh, it was pretty full on. Um, yeah, I often say like a film of this, of this size, if you think about the whole thing, you, you can maybe go into the corner of the room and have a good cry. But I think you, you obviously have to parcel things out because, um, it is just so, uh, you know, in one of my interviews, in fact, for the EPK, I think the first thing out of my mouth was this movie is huge. And I, I laugh at that now because I remember being interviewed that day and we were on the carnival at the carnival and there was a lineup of 18 um, minor characters along with our principals. Um, and, you know, that kind of maneuvering beyond the, again, the artistic, the actual uh, maneuvering of, of uh, checking everyone's rooms and making sure everything's fine and um, bringing them all to set and then uh, sitting, you know, on set and doing the final painting of aging and uh, according to what's on, on frame, it, it was a big project, but uh, so rewarding and so um, uh, beyond the challenge, it was, it was, uh, uh, a good, um, I want to say like boot camp for, for costume designer. Cause it, you're just nonstop go, 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 uh, lightning round. I would say for about, uh, uh, 18 months. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a huge project and so incredibly impressive when you look at the level of detailing in every single frame of the film that you've put together. And especially hearing you describe, you know, all of the sourcing that went into that, all of the craftsmanship that went into building everything from scratch from the ground up. So it's a really immense achievement and I congratulate you hugely on it. Thank you so much Louis, Thank for you. telling us all about it. Thank I really you. appreciate it. Thank you very much.